Test nine, section one. George and Lisa are overseas students studying in Britain. They are returning home for the summer holidays. First, you have some time to read the example and questions one to four. Now listen to the following conversation and answer questions one to four. That'll be twenty-three dollars, right? There's your change. Have a nice trip. Oh, I'll just get your bags out of the boot. Thank you very much. Now, George, let's find the check-in desk. Yes, but with all the changes they have made here at the airport, I'm not sure where the check-in desk is. I know it's strange, isn't it? Why don't we ask for help? Good idea. What about that man sitting down over there? Which one? The one with the hat on and in the trolley? No, the one with the uniform behind the table. I'll ask him. Excuse me. Could you tell me where the check-in desk for France Air is, please? Oh, um, let me think. The best way to get there would be to turn left at the end there, where the cafe is, and then go straight ahead until you're opposite the departure gate's entrance. Oh, no, 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 no. S sorry. Um, it might be quicker to turn right as soon as you get past the cafe, and keep going along the corridor until you come to the sliding doors at the end. On the left. Yes, that's it. All the check-in counters are in a hall there. I'm pretty sure France Air is directly to your left as you walk in the hall. Thanks a lot. So it's the left past the cafe and then right opposite the bookshop. You can't miss it. Come on then, Lisa. We don't want to be late, and I want some time to get a cup of coffee and look around the bookshop. Okay, George, but I want to go to the restroom first. I'll meet you at the check-in desk. George now speaks to the clerk at the check-in counter. First, you have some time to look at the form. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions five to eleven. Good morning. Can I help you? Yes, I would like to check in for flight FA four nine two. Very good.、Uh, can I have your ticket and passport, please? Oh yes, here you are. Okay, thanks.、Uh, if you could just put your suitcase on the scales. Oh, I have this extra box that I want to take as well. Okay, well. That's extra luggage, so I'll have to get you to fill out an excess baggage declaration certificate. It'll cost extra, I'm afraid. Let me see. Um, forty dollars exactly. If the total value of your contents is under four hundred dollars. Oh well, what's the form for? It's just a form you have to fill out so that if there are any problems, we'll know where you are and how to contact you. So if you can give me a few details, I'll key in the information. Okay then, your passport says your name is Lavier. Is that right? Yes, George Lavier. George, uh, L A V I L L I E R S. Good. Now, nationality: French. No, wait a minute. It's a Swiss passport. Well, yes, I live in France, but I was born in Switzerland. Swiss. Very good. Flight number. F A four nine two destination is Paris. Are you connecting with any other flight in Paris, or will you be staying there? I'm spending my vacation in Paris. Well, Sèvres, just outside Paris. Okay. So, what's the phone number there? Um, let me think. The country code for France is thirty、uh, three, and the number is one nine eight six one four five three seven. Right, so that's three three one nine eight six one four five three seven. Yes, that's it. And can you tell me briefly what you have in the box? Well, there are some books, just university textbooks from last semester, some clothes, and、uh, oh, yeah, my computer discs. Okay, thank you. And what would be the approximate value of the contents?、Mm, quite a bit, actually. 
About, um, yes, about $150. That's all. There's your receipt for the box, your passport and ticket, and here is your boarding pass. Gate 7. You can board the plane in about 35 minutes. Have a nice flight. That is the end of section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 2. In this section, you'll hear an introduction on the housing conditions in Chapmanville. First, you have some time to read questions 12 to 20. Now listen carefully to the introduction and answer questions 12 to 20. Hi, I'm Gavin Murray. I'm the rental manager for the Central Chapmanville Real Estate Agency. I'm a real estate agent, much like any other, in that I help people buy and sell houses. But about half of my time is spent working to assist people in renting houses and flats. I've been in this business for a dozen years now, and I know the city very well in terms of which areas are the better places to live and how much it costs to rent in these areas. Now, I normally divide Chapmanville into three areas in terms of rental prices. Generally speaking, the area in the northern part of the city is the low end of the spectrum, the cheapest housing. So if you're looking to spend as little as possible on rent, I suggest you look there. The most expensive area would be the eastern part of Chapmanville. Most people think it's the prettiest part of the metropolitan area because of all the hills and parks. As so many people desire to live there, housing prices tend to be quite high. The middle market in terms of price for accommodation is found in the city's western and southern areas. Now, let me give some examples of how much it will cost you to rent in these areas. Let's imagine you're a single person looking for a one-bedroom flat. In eastern Chapmanville, you would be paying no less than $650 a month for such a flat. You won't find anything for less than that. But a lot of people pay as much as $1,100 per month or more. The higher priced flats are usually the ones in the hills, which run through the east. They've got the best views of the city. A similarly sized flat in the west of the city and the south, two for that matter, would cost you at most $650. But there are many flats going for less, and if you look around a bit, you can find one for as little as $350. That's quite a reasonable rental price for most people. If you find that too expensive, I suggest you head to Chapmanville's North, where the cheapest flats are to be found. One-bedroom flats there start from about $170 a month and up to about $400. Now, for those of you who want something bigger you'll have to be prepared to pay about double those prices for a small two- or three-bedroom house. That goes for any of the areas I mentioned. OK, so much for prices. What are the advantages and disadvantages of these areas? Well, I told you that the eastern part of Chapmanville is the prettiest. There are lots of parks and lots of trees all around there. Oh, I should mention that the only public transport in the east is the bus. There aren't any trains, so it's not that convenient, as you can imagine, even though it's richer part of the city. In the south, you've also got the river, but you won't find too many parks there, because of all the factories alongside the river. In fact, there's quite a bit of industry in the south, which makes it a less desirable place to live. Still, the south is convenient because of public transport. The south has very good train services to the city centre, as well as buses. And that's why a lot of people choose to live there. I said earlier that western and southern parts of Chapmanville 
are about the same in terms of the price you pay for accommodation. They also have the same sort of public transport services, but the two areas are quite different in other ways. The west is next to the bay, so it's quite attractive in that sense. But there are a couple of problems with the west. One is that the bay is polluted, so polluted in fact that you wouldn't want to swim there. I used to take my family there about ten years ago, but now I wouldn't go near it. The other disadvantage of the west is that it is where the airport is, the Chapmanville International Airport. The noise can be quite annoying. Lastly, the north. In northern Chapmanville, as I said before, housing is cheap, quite cheap in fact, but you pay in other ways. For example, the area is very low and made up entirely of wetlands. It's beautiful in a way, but it attracts an incredible amount of insects for most of the year. The mosquitoes there are really bad. This makes things quite unpleasant, and so few people have any real wish to live there. But if money's a problem, that's the place to go. Just bring your insect repellent. Let me finish by again welcoming you all to Chapmanville and wishing you good luck in finding accommodation and settling down in whichever part of the city which suits you best. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section three. In this section, you'll hear an interview on job application. First, you have some time to read questions twenty-one to thirty-one. Now listen carefully to the interview and answer questions twenty-one to thirty-one. These days, it's hard enough to find a suitable job, let alone get as far as an interview. Dozens of people every day send off their curriculum vitae or application form and wait, hopefully, to be summoned for an interview. Now, this apparently is where a lot of people fall down because of their inadequacy at completing their application forms, according to Judith Davidson, author of Getting a Job, a popular book which has recently come onto the market. Our reporter Christopher Shields decided to look into this apparent inability of the British to sell themselves, and he spoke to Judith Davidson about it. Judith Davidson lectures at a management training college for young men and women. Most of whom have just graduated from university and gone there to take a crash course in management techniques. One of the hardest things is not passing the exams, not passing the course examinations successfully, but actually finding employment afterwards. So Judith now concentrates on helping trainees to set about doing just this, and she tries to work out the reasons why chances of getting a job are pretty small. Very often, a job application or a curriculum vitae will contain basic grammatical or careless spelling mistakes, even from university graduates. Then those that do get as far as an interview become inarticulate or clumsy when they try to talk about themselves. It doesn't matter how highly qualified or brilliant you may be, if you come across as tongue-tied and gauche, your chances are quite slim. What are other problems of the application forms? Some letters are dirty and untidily written, with finger marks all over them and ink blots or even coffee stains. Others arrive on lined or flowered or sometimes scented paper, none of which is likely to make a good impression on the average business-like boss. Many people are unable to make that initial impact with an employer. In fact, it needs techniques to send an application. Which will stand out from the rest and persuade the employer you're the right one for the job. 
This prompted an enterprising young man called Mark Ashworth, a recruitment consultant himself, to start writing job applications for other people for a fee as a sideline. He told me he got the idea in America, where it's already big business, and in the last few months alone he's written over 35 CVs. He feels that 80% of job applications received by personnel managers are inadequate in some way. Well, yes, many people simply can't cope with grammar and spelling and don't know what to put in or leave out. Sometimes people condense their work experience so much that a future employer doesn't know enough about him. Then, on the other hand, some people go too far the other way. To give you an example, one CV I once received in my recruiting role was getting on for 30 pages long. Mark has an initial interview with all his clients in which he tries to make them think about their motivation. He can often exploit these experiences in the CV he writes for them and shows that they have been valuable preparation for the job now sought. He also believes that well-prepared job history and a good letter of application are absolutely essential. Among the most important aspects of applications are spelling, correct grammar, content and layout. A new boss will probably also be impressed with a good reference or a letter of commendation written by a former employer. The type of CV I aim to produce depends largely on the kind of job being applied for. They don't always have to be slick or highly sophisticated, but in certain cases this does help. Judith Davidson thought very much along the same lines as Mark. In her opinion, one of the most important aspects of job applications was that they should be easy to read. Many applicants send in letters and forms which are virtually unreadable. The essence of handwritten application is that they should be neat, legible, and the spelling should be accurate. I stress handwritten because most employers want a sample of their future employees' writing. Many believe this gives some indication of the character of the person who wrote it. Some people forget vital things like putting their own address or the date. Others fail to do what's required of them by a job advertisement. Judith believes that job seekers should always send an accompanying letter along with their application forms, stating clearly why their qualifications make them suitable for the vacancy. Personal details have no place in letters of application. I well remember hearing about one such letter which stated, quite bluntly, I need more money to pay for my flat. No boss would be impressed by such directness. She added that the art of applying for jobs successfully was having to be learnt by more and more people these days, with the current unemployment situation. With as many as two or three hundred people applying for one vacancy, a boss would want to see only a small fraction of that number in person for an interview. So your application had to really outshine all the others to get you on the short list. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4. In this section, you'll hear a lecture on human civilization. First, you have some time to read questions 32 to 40. Now listen carefully to the interview and answer questions 32 to 40. Today in our history series lectures, Professor Smith is going to introduce the history of human civilization. Welcome, Professor Smith. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Do you know when human civilization originated? 
And what's the development of human language? Well, the first two stages in the development of civilized man were probably the invention of primitive weapons and the discovery of fire. Though nobody knows exactly when he acquired the use of the latter, the origin of language is also obscure. No doubt, it began very gradually. Animals have a few cries that serve as signals, but even the highest apes have not been found able to pronounce words, even with the most intensive professional instruction. Apparently, a necessity for the mastering of speech is the superior brain of man. When man became sufficiently intelligent, we must suppose that he gradually increased the number of cries for different purposes. It was a great day when he discovered that speech could be used for narrative. There are those who think that in this respect, picture language preceded oral language. A man could draw a picture on the wall of his cave to show in which direction he had gone. Or what prey he hoped to catch. Probably, picture language and oral language developed side by side. I'm inclined to think that language has been the most important single factor in the development of man. Two important stages came not so long before the dawn of written history. The first was the domestication of animals. The second was agriculture. Agriculture was a step in human progress to which, subsequently, there was nothing comparable until our own machine age. Agriculture made possible an immense increase in the number of the human species in the regions where it could be successfully practiced. These were, at first, only those in which nature fertilized the soil after each harvest. Agriculture met with violent resistance from the pastoral nomads, but the agricultural way of life prevailed in the end because of the physical comforts it provided. Another fundamental technical advance was writing, which, like spoken language, Developed out of pictures, but as soon as it had reached a certain stage, it was possible to keep records and transmit information to people who were not present when the invasion was given. These inventions and discoveries—fire, speech, weapons, domestic animals, agriculture, and writing—made the existence of civilized communities possible. From about 3,000 B.C. until the Industrial Revolution, less than 200 years ago. There was no technical advance comparable to these. During this long period, man had enough time to become accustomed to his technique and to develop the beliefs and political organizations to appropriate it. There was, of course, an immense extension in the area of civilized life. At first, it had been confined to the Nile, the Euphrates, the Tigris, and the Indus. But at the end of the period in question, it covered much the greater part of the livable globe. I do not mean to suggest that there was no technical progress during this long time. There was progress. There were even two inventions of great importance, namely gunpowder and the mariner's compass. But neither of these can be compared in their revolutionary power to such things as speech and writing and agriculture. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test.